um, reasons. That was critical to Habermas, uh, as, and uh, as several people, Jerry Mackey's paper, for example, points out. Um, that's been very, very much loosened. We, there, there's, even Habermas uh, will um, now uh, encompass a, uh, what, what, what Jerry, the word Jerry uses and what a lot of pe words people use, considerations, that you bring considerations to the table. And those considerations, those are things that I offer as a, as a reason. But my reason could only, could be, that feels terrible to me. And when you say why, I say, I'm not exactly sure yet. I, I it just feel, I, I, I don't know, I can't go along with that. I, that that's just, just doesn't, uh, doesn't work for me. And then the purpose of our deliberation is partly to help me figure out why, but not necessarily through a whole set of cognitive logics, through an exploration of our interactions and so forth. So, oops, oh my god. Somebody, I, I don't want to restart now, so uh, I'll leave this to someone else. Um, so then the aim at consensus I've already mentioned, we now aim at clarifying uh, interests, common good orientation. Um, a, a paper that a, a bunch of colleagues and I wrote recently doesn't say, no, there are certain circumstances in which you should bring self-interest to the table, otherwise you're going to obfuscate it. If, if, if um, we have to talk about everything, if you and I are married, we have to talk about everything in terms of what's good for the marriage and can't ever put down on the table that actually we have some conflicting interests that we have to talk about. Then we'll talk about it in, in different ways. Okay, so um, sincerity. Um, Mark Warren's pointed out, sometimes you need a few little white lies. Um, equal participation. Equal participation, back in the old women's movement, Red Stockings had a thing where every time you spoke, you put down a little piece of paper, and the, you know, the, sort of the ideal practically was every person speaks this large, not same number of words. No, that's obviously not what we want. We want more of a sort of equal opportunity of access. Um, there's a paper I've written where you can get the sites to this. But two things remain unchallenged. One is respect, and one is absence of power as a goal. That is to say, uh, the power that a uh, greater power that I have ought not to interfere in our deliberations. And something that's brand new that's on the stage is the epistemic value of deliberation. That is to say, getting knowledge out, getting facts out, getting a good outcome out. That wasn't really part of Habermas's original thought, but it's, it's in there now. Um, now, just very quickly, I suggest that we can't, many theorists nowadays are beginning to use the word deliberation, which has got packed into it, normative qualities, a bit more neutrally, and then talking using these standards about high quality versus low quality deliberation. That allows us to say that some parts of the deliberative system are very low quality, but they're very useful for other purposes. Um, now, to turn to Arjun's very uh, useful paper. Um, he begins by saying the evidence we have so far and our general intuitions um, are that the efforts of the poor uh, to change their conditions through democratic deliberation have almost always been failures. And I think if you look at the very local level, the village level and so forth, that's um, often the case when it comes to redistribution of a major sort. Now Jerry Mackey will talk about how in regard to other issues, local local deliberation can produce major changes. But if we're trying to change um, major world issues, the local deliberation is not going to do very much. But let's, let's think about deliberation on a broader scale. Let's think about, for example, the civil rights movement or suffrage for women or human rights, international labor standards. Sometimes you can use power in these instances. But pretty much by definition, um, the poor often don't have much power. Um, that's, I mean, they're poor. Uh, often they're a minority. Blacks in the civil rights movement were only 10% of the population. They couldn't have outvoted everybody. So they had to make normative arguments. And what went on in the course of the civil rights movement was a normative deliberation that was essentially nationwide and it was triggered by protests and so forth. And the protests could, st the one, the uh, boycott of the buses in Birmingham was a power move. That was the exercise of the power that the poor actually had to 
to make the bus companies lose a lot of money. And there were exercises of power. But a lot of what was going on was not the exercise of power, but rather a larger deliberative process. Um, now, we all know, I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this graffiti from the 1968 French, um, I participate, uh, you participate, he participates, we participate, you participate, and they profit. Um, and so we all know that participation can be used to cool out the mark. And it's the same with deliberation. Oh, let's just come and deliberate, 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 deliberate until you fall asleep. And then the, everyone else will go off and do what they were already going to do. Um, but as Arjun points out, deliberation can develop these skills in a deliberative chain, and it can change norms. It can enhance the capacity to aspire. I was going to spend more time on this, but it turned out I spent more. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to pick out his key, some of his key points in this paper that are terrific. Even failures can, le can lead to sort of be rehearsals of this ongoing strategy, leading to this kind of incremental success. Um, and f uh, finally, deliberation can coax performatives, uh, I pro namely things like I promise or statements that are somewhat pr promising from the, part from the more powerful participants. Um, economists will call, sometimes call these, uh, these statements, these promises, cheap talk. And they say that if it's not backed up, if this kind of talk is not backed up by something, then it's, it's written on the air. It means nothing. But because of our uh, human uh, um, norms of interaction, when I say I promise this performative that Arjun was talking about, it actually changes the world. It changes our relationships. There is a meaning to the, wor to the words I promise. And they mean I now, after, after I've said those words, am obligated to follow through. Uh, or I have to come up with some reasons why I couldn't, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that his performance, one of the things that happens in these deliberative settings is that the more powerful people make promise-like utterances. Sometimes they actually say, I will do X. Uh, but sometimes they just um, imply or say it more, uh, say it a little bit more um, subtly. But what we found, uh, you know, I used to be just an incredible skeptic about all these women's Beijing, this, that, and papers, da-da, UN, da-da, da-da, da-da. And then I saw that people were holding governments to them, even Latin American dictators who had signed it thinking, oh, what the heck. Uh, you know, <laughs> Catherine Sick, uh, Sicking shows that then grassroots groups can start to hold them to it. And because of our human understanding of what a promise is, they're in a situation they didn't think they were in. And that's what, that's for me one of the beauties of Arjun's paper, is showing how this kind of, these sort of subtle promises can appear in deliberation and then be held, then be used in later scale deliberation to hold people to their, to their promises. Okay, thank you very much.